Moral of the story is I chose a half measure, when I should have gone all the way. I will never make that mistake again. From Purgosian to Purgosian out. Exactly two months after Wagner's mutiny began, and promptly ended, Wagner leader Yevgeny Purgosian's plane came crashing down, or crashing down, about halfway between Moscow and St. Petersburg, a fitting end given that the Thunder Run, the cause of all this, also stopped about halfway. At the time of recording, we do not have final confirmation about who was on board, but both Prigozhin and Wagner namesake Dmitry Utkin are widely suspected to have perished, though one imagines the world is about to play the grandest game of hashtag where's Prigozhin until a body surfaces. Anyway, today, we are going to discuss the implications of this latest plot twist, starting with the important background information that you need to know, what it means for Wagner's global empire, how it fits into the Kremlin's recent attempts to rein in hardliners, and the short-term risks to political stability within Russia, including whether Purgosian will have the last laugh. But we begin with the background. The saga began on June 23rd, when Purgosian, apparently fed up with Kremlin war policy, staged a mutiny in Rostov-on-Don, in an effort to capture Minister of Defense Sergei Shoigu and Chief of Staff Valery Gerasimov. Failing to locate them, Wagner troops shifted their efforts north toward Moscow, turning the spectacle into an unplanned coup. Then, as quickly as it started, it ended, with the troops only reaching the aforementioned halfway point, and with the deal being that Wagner would have to exile themselves to Belarus, but would otherwise be pardoned. The key question mark, as we discussed at the time, was whether the otherwise mutually acceptable deal could be enforced. For a while, things seemed fine, with Prigozhin floating around St. Petersburg and Moscow, then, according to reports, eventually entering Belarus, before being most recently seen in Africa. But then he, or at least his plane, came back to Moscow. Finally, on August 23rd, while flying over the settlement of Kuzenkino, which, by the way, has the coolest flag. You can tell that their population of 2,400 just did not care at all, so much so that they put a giant golden Russian bear on it. The plane came crashing, or crashing down. Everyone suspected that Prigozhin would be hit with tainted tea or fall through a window, but in a field where there are no coincidences, one imagines that the plane was forced down, even if the New York Times had a humorously timed, in-depth report on recent close calls. But regardless, Prigozhin indeed will never make the mistake of a half-measure again, even if the reason why is rather grisly. As for the implications, the obvious start is with Wagner's global holdings, most specifically in Africa. Wagner did standard mercenary work there, offering security to regimes if the price was right, with payment usually in the form of local mineral wealth. This was lucrative to the organization, but also politically helpful for the Kremlin, as it protected Russian-friendly regimes in a manner reminiscent of the Cold War. Gotta make sure those lines on maps are favorable to you. Thus, when Putin went hard after the mutineers in his first video response, only to suddenly seem to give Wagner and Prigozhin a free pass, the speculation turned to whether Prigozhin was too big to fail. In other words, Putin valued Wagner's work in Africa so much, and without an obvious replacement, he had to grant Prigozhin more latitude than an autocrat normally would. But not only was there no latitude in actuality, there was no altitude either, as that theory appeared to go down with the plane. Meanwhile, Russian diplomats had reportedly gone on a trip to Libya the day before, likely in an effort to begin trying to find a way to supplant Wagner. And that will be necessary, as there is little for Wagner's troops to fall back on, with Utkin also on board the doomed flight. That does not mean it will be impossible for Russia to rebound, just difficult. The apparent killing actually follows a recent pattern in Russian politics. The Kremlin has gone on a bit of a purge of its hardline critics, many of whom believed that the Kremlin was not trying hard enough to win the war. The problem with trying hard, of course, 
is that Russia would need to deploy more bodies in order to make offensive progress. However, from the start of the war, beginning with Putin's announcement of a special military operation, the Kremlin's goal has been to minimize disruption to the average Russian's everyday life. Obviously, that backfired with the insufficient force to take Kyiv. And when it became clear that there weren't enough warm bodies to even hold the East, Putin reluctantly announced a larger mobilization, which has indeed frozen the front lines. But fast forwarding to today, one wonders whether the Kremlin can politically survive another round of mass mobilization. The more hopeful interpretation of the crash from Kyiv's perspective is that the Kremlin is setting conditions to withdraw from Ukraine. We recently discussed how Putin is not dead to rights if Russia loses the war. Part of that survival strategy is silencing the hardliners, perhaps by crashing some planes. To be clear, we are still a long way from a Russian withdrawal. Ukraine will have to make more serious progress in its offensive before it really becomes a part of the conversation. But if the Kremlin is quietly worried about that possibility, now is the time to take action. Of course, silencing challengers creates a classic catch-22 because your efforts can cause the exact challenges you are trying to stop. Here, that could come in three different flavors. We have discussed before how proactive coups and internal disloyalty are self-fulfilling prophecies. So, to keep it short, if another hardliner thinks that he will be the next one to have a Putin-ordered accident, that gives him all the incentive in the world to take action, before he finds himself six feet under. Second is the possibility that Prigozhin had a dead man switch. That is something that automatically goes off in the event of a person's death. Here, that could mean that Prigozhin had some kind of compromat on Putin, set to be released if, say, he had not logged into his email in a week. This would be fitting because Russia has such a system for nuclear weapons. Of course, if you have seen Dr. Strangelove, then you would know that if you have that kind of compromat, you would be better off telling them that you do, so that they are deterred from killing you. Still, it is possible that the Kremlin just preferred to run the risk, or that another faction, perhaps the FSB, did the operation on their own. Regardless of a dead man's switch, the final issue here is that there are, or were, Plenty of Wagner soldiers more loyal to Prigozhin than Putin. Another big question mark is their commitment to that loyalty. Following the mutiny, were they only willing to back down because their leader indicated that it was okay? And will the average Russian soldier, many of whom liked Prigozhin, get angry over the power play? If so, then the Kremlin faces a large number of well-armed and well-trained men out looking for revenge. Now, if you are not out looking for revenge, but rather a good read, might I suggest taking a deeper dive into the causes of the invasion? Check the video description for more information on that. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care. On the off chance that Prigozhin got a heads up, was not aboard the plane, and avoided the special military landing, can you imagine what a plot twist that would be?